we're going to be starting now just because our time is relatively limited and we're hoping to um, really use it wisely and we will start with a preliminary meditation a meditation that will be in itself hopefully an act of kindness to our body speech and mind because of course uh, because of course everything we're doing in this course is about cultivating that warm hearted tenderness towards ourselves and then in concentric, concentric circles reaching out to other beings but we start right here with this very person sitting here not me but each one of us depending on where we are and we start with the practice that would be deeply familiar to many of you where we allow these three blocks of energy the physical energy the verbal energy and the mental energy to find some rest find some ease and rest that would best support us to uh, best support us in any other types of contemplative practice that we do so let's find a comfortable stationary position and once again for some of us that would be the supine position where we're lying flat on our back in the so-called shavasana posture comfortable stable with our hands to the sides just resting quietly hopefully with our back supported with our neck supported properly and so forth for some of us it would be the upright position where we're sitting with our legs crossed or with our feet flat on the ground ankles uncrossed then and of course as usual some people would choose something in between these two positions because their bodies have unique needs which is absolutely fine to honor and respect but then once we do adopt this posture once we do adopt this position our first act is to reconnect with the element of the earth by bringing our awareness to the parts of the body that are currently in contact with the cushion the floor the yoga mat the couch the sofa whatever it is that we're relying on so noticing the sensations of stability and firmness right there Noticing the tactile sensations around these areas, whether that's our feet, the back of our legs, our buttocks, our lower back, or the entire backside of our body. And in observing these parts of the body, gradually releasing physical tension. Entrusting ourselves to the ground by simply relaxing our muscles when that's available and if that's available to us. And when it's not, simply noticing the knots of tension and being mindfully aware of them. And then with that, breathing naturally, not trying to control the breath, to make it more shallow or more deep, to hold it in any way, but simply allowing the body to choose the optimal rhythm, the optimal volume, the optimal depth on its own. With each new cycle of breathing, In this process of observation, paying special attention to the sensations that change with each inhalation and exhalation throughout our body. As if there were tactile waves going through our body as we breathe, and we were attending to those tactile waves to the changing sensations. 
but in that observation, allowing these waves to wash away any and all knots of tension, all restlessness. And all that prevents us from being comfortable and content right now, simply observing the breath as it moves through the body, the sensations associated with the breath. And so our task or our creative challenge or our quest for these minutes of mindfulness of breathing is to see whether we can return to the experience of mindful awareness of the breath and at the same time have some contentment with it. So anytime we notice distractions arising out of boredom, restlessness, agitation, the need to entertain ourselves with thoughts of stories, anything like that, or even simply getting distracted with regards to outer sounds and so forth, gently releasing that grasp and returning to the very simple movements of the breath in our body. The same tactile waves, soothing us again and again and again. If we're noticing ourselves becoming a bit lethargic, a bit sleepy, experiencing some sluggishness, adding a bit more clarity with regards to observation, trying to notice finer details about the sensations, having greater curiosity. Or on the physical level, maybe adding a teeny tiny smile on our face. That also helps with the levels of energy. And so in that way, constantly balancing clarity and ease, releasing restlessness, increasing acuity, but mostly just resting with contentment. And then relying on this basic level of mental balance that we have established through observing the breath in preparation for the actual class, all the discussions, all the contemplation, 
journaling, taking notes, thinking, exploring, meditating. We generate a vast and profound motivation by thinking of our own highest spiritual and psychological aspirations. What types of flourishing, especially inner flourishing, do I want to attain? Through all of my contemplative practice, all of my psychological work and so forth. Aspiring for that, that's where I direct my energy today with this class, with these practices. But then adding the vast component of also aspiring for greater happiness and well being for all beings, not just for ourselves. So that the entire matrix of interdependence that we find ourselves in is enriched by genuine kindness, compassion, genuine joy, equanimous open-heartedness, and profound wisdom. May this session, our practice, everything we do serve that purpose. With this aspiration, we return to the body, noticing its sensations, grounding ourselves in embodied awareness. And that then, having noticed the body, we perhaps add a little bit of movement to return to our actual physical space. And so we can wiggle our toes and fingers, rock back and forth very gently, stretch if that feels right and nice in the moment. Take a sip of water if that's necessary, and then slowly, quietly and calmly, we transition into our shared online space and a little bubble of personal retreat space that we also have right now to deepen our practice. Thank you. And um, we'll be slowly returning to the slides and uh, the material presented in them. But this is also an opportunity, of course, for us to have some exchange around everything that we're doing. And so in the beginning of this session and all of our ensuing sessions and our previous sessions as well, what we do is a little bit of sharing, just sharing some basic ideas, some points that were joyful, maybe some points that were a bit complicated or that we contemplated with regards to what we were discussing last time and the time before that. And maybe it's just a little observation, something about the difficulty of maintaining regular practice and so forth. Maybe it's something about the five principles, uh, five ethical guidelines or Panchashila, which is something that we discussed last time as a precursor to a profound sense of inner flourishing. Or maybe just being able to notice more flowers um, on a good day and feeling more joy. Because all of this, of course, would be related to both mindful awareness, which is the root of it all, and our experience of being, being kind with ourselves and with others. So anything and everything you might want to share, please share it in the chat. I'll read it out. Uh, once again, if something feels more personal, you can address it to me, and then I'll read it out anonymously. Uh, and also, uh, if you have any questions, this is the opportunity to ask them before we progress from where we left off last time. And for my own side, also is a little bit of sharing of experience in between these classes. I can say that just thinking about these classes and the fact that we're meeting regularly and we're discussing these beautiful, beautiful methods 
is something that brings me a lot of joy and a great sense of meaning in terms of these weeks that we're going to be spending together in this course. So in addition to the other types of work that I do and just the regular daily activities of taking care of my body, my mind and so forth, thinking, hey, every Sunday night, and it's Sunday night for me, usually, well, always, every Sunday night, I'm doing something lovely uh, with a wonderful group of people. And it's not just something lovely, like going to a park and having a picnic, that would be lovely. But it's beyond that, it's something that has to do with the deepest levels of kindness, uh, and meaning that we can cultivate in our lives. So yay, that makes me very joyful. Um, and that's a point of joy for my practice. In the previous session, you mentioned the course you took uh, on CB at CCN, and I could find it on that website. In the introductory video, you talk a lot about emotions, but not how to treat moods. My question is if these recordings can help me with moods, and if so, if I can contact you by email for any questions that arise from the recordings. CEB, the Cultivating Emotion Balance Approach, uh, starts with uh, techniques for working with emotions, but many of those same techniques also then apply to moods. Moods and emotions are very uh, strongly interdependent. Moods are not made from individual instances of emotions, but sometimes a mood can be triggered by a specific emotional episode, or sometimes many emotional episodes, and emotions are much more short-lived. Uh, many emotional episodes can arise against the background of that mood. So any techniques, any contemplative techniques that we work with, including everything that we're learning in this course, will be helpful both for emotions and moods. So from that point of view, all the contemplative work that's done in CB trainings, and there are of course many online CB trainings that you can find recorded uh, or running live and so forth, there are many different options. They would be helpful for moods as well, just like the uh, aspects of practice that we're using in this uh, specific course. And yeah, if you have questions about the CB materials uh, presented on CCN website, you can absolutely email me uh, through uh, the website and I'll try to address the questions as best as I can, as well as I can. So that's that. I have been feeling the importance and support of Sangha recently, uh, the importance of being on this path together with others, particularly in these very difficult times. That's very true. That's also very true for me and I think for many people, because uh, even an online course like this even though many people also feel the need to have, of course, in-person interactions when that's available with regards to rules, regulations, uh, safety guidelines, and so forth. But when, of course, in addition to having in-person interactions, even having an intentional community of practice that is temporary in nature in that we're just gathering for these 11 weeks, but yet is intentional. It does have um, a, an aspiration lying at the root of it. That can be strongly supportive. And just knowing that every week at this time, we can show up, we can share things, we can ask things, we can contemplate things together, we can practice together. That's a huge source of support. Of support and that's one reason amongst many for why historically, for example, in the Buddhist tradition, there was such a strong emphasis on establishing the Sangha community uh, or the intentional community of practice where, of course, some practitioners would be newer to the practices compared to us, and some practitioners would be much more advanced than us. And then in that shared space, uh, shared energetic space of intentional practice, we can all support each other. We're not uh, necessarily fixing each other in any way. Um, and in a way, neither does group therapy. It doesn't, individual participants don't fix each other, but just that safe, loving, space is very, very important. And that is a thing that for some people is missing in their contemplative practice. So even to have a um, makeshift uh, intentional community, temporary intentional community is a wonderful thing. Absolutely. Uh, there was a sentence in chapter one. Oh, sorry, going back. Getting back to a routine and daily practice of meditation uh, after a long pause during the last two years, enjoying community sangha and connection meditating together is lovely. I feel supported and nourished by these CCN sessions and with my Sangha here in Kansas with Laura Mead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lobsang. Yeah, it's lovely. The more good communities we have, the better, of course. And there are 
job is to support and inspire us in our own practice. And then whatever we cultivate in our practice, we go back to the community and we're able to, just through being there, but being there in the spirit of loving kindness, we're able to help and support others. Because sometimes we're not maybe resourced that much, but we show up to a community and we see that others who are currently more resourced than us, they are shining with their loving kindness and their tenderness and their compassion and just their mindful presence and their practice of nonviolence and so forth. And it truly feels powerful to be around individuals who in those, in those moments are truly able to care, to show up for us. There was a sentence in chapter one of our reading that really resonated with me about the Buddha comparing each of us to atoms. Inside each atom is a Buddha. The Buddha is the atom splitter. This, and, uh, quote unquote, uh, uh, quote, this entails a sense of discovery rather than cultivation, a simple unveiling rather than an arduous effort at development. I found this very profound as I've always been working on cultivation, uh, cultivating kindness and compassion rather than discovering them within me. That's absolutely true. And of course, in actual fact, the two approaches of discovery and cultivation are mutually supportive. So in this specific course, we will use both. And um, my personal preference and my personal passion, especially in the last few years of my more formal studies in the Tibetan tradition, I have a lot of passion for the discovery approach. But in my previous years of training, I have also discovered the incredible benefit of the cultivation approach where slowly, slowly we're strengthening those qualities as if we were training muscles. There's benefit and value and beauty in that. And yet sometimes life feels overwhelming, but then when we return to the discovery approach, we're reminded, hey, right there at the core of our being is a roaring, powerful, blazing sun of loving kindness that's already there. And we just need to peel off some things that are hiding it from sight. So that, that becomes very, very powerful as a source of compassion, actually, and of course, loving kindness and so forth, not just for others, but for ourselves, because then we see, hey, I'm not the low quality, poor me that I sometimes believe I am. I'm actually, yes, this identity and everything that I am in daily life. I have the, all these labels. I have this culture, the background, the trauma, the woundedness, the heart, break it, broken heartedness and so forth. Well, that's all true. And yet beyond that, teeny tiny Buddha sitting in that atom. Absolutely. Truly. Oh, my one recommendation would be when you come across uh, quotes like that, copy them out, just like those short quotes that feel inspiring and uh, nice, copying them out, maybe onto a device, if you have uh, some note taking app that you're using, but also maybe in a nice little notebook, that's certainly something that I do. Um, and of course, that's where our spiritual materialism as in choosing the best kind of notebook can really run amok. And that's fine, we choose something that is inspiring. So I have a little uh, actually $2 uh, handmade paper uh, notebook made here locally in Nepal and sold through um, a local craft store uh, that I very much like. But then copying these short snippy quotes there. And then when we feel bad or when we feel, oh, I'm drowning or somebody help, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pull through the, the mental anguish. It's so too much or something like that. When we feel that opening it and seeing those quotes, it can be a very, very powerful thing. And they don't only have to be very positive, hang in there, uh, kitty kind of things. They can also be a little bit challenging, challenging our grasping, challenging our self-cherishing as opposed to genuine kindness for ourselves or challenging our grasping at permanence. That's also fine. But combining them would be, once again, a huge source of support. So then that little notebook or that little collection of quotes in your uh, app can become part of our individual mandala of inspiration, which is a very important thing for the practice of four measurables, but also for every type of contemplative practice that we do. So that's one recommendation. And you found a beautiful quote already. Truly, although this may sound trivial, one of the greatest conundrums this week was in the use of electric fly catcher to protect our kitchen. It zaps the flying insects somewhat instantaneously, I guess. Oh, he wouldn't hurt a fly. Hmm, not so much, it turns out. I'm a vegetarian, but when it comes to non-killing, it seems I have sides of the soul problem. Any thoughts? Well, that's a big thing. And of course, it's very much related to the five guidelines or Panchashila. 
one of those guidelines is not to kill, but then we have many different considerations that, for example, have to do with, hmm, what do I do if I have, if I, for some reason, get intestinal worms, or what do I do with domestic insects, and so forth. So all these considerations, I'm not going to give any ready-made answers, and I don't have any, because in each individual situation, we apply our compassion, thinking, oh, well, okay, these beings also have a wish for happiness, a wish to avoid suffering, compassion. We combine our wisdom. Oh, well, also these things need to be done, this and this and this and that. And our creativity. Is there a creative approach to avoid killing beings while also protecting the kitchen? So we combine all of that on our level. We Google and we think and we discuss this with other people who have that practical experience. And we see something that might come up. So the Dalai Lama famously, um, in one of the books that I'm uh, working on and translating it into Russian, the Dalai Lama uh, often jokes about how one mosquito can be a huge source of irritation for us, of course, if we're spending the night with it. And that is related to a very famous quote from the Dalai Lama, if you think you're too small to make a change in the world, try sleeping with a mosquito, which truly a powerful thought to contemplate. But then what to do if you are, you are actually sleeping with a mosquito in the room? When the Dalai Lama in the book that I'm working on uh, says, uh, yes, I work hard on controlling just the instinctive urge to slap the mosquito and so forth. But then in the morning, I ask my attendant to install better nets on the windows. Because of course, if we can install good nets or even use the uh, insect net that can be uh, put over the bed and so forth, why wouldn't we? That's extra protection, but also that would protect us from the need to slap those mosquitoes. So I'm not saying it boils down to just installing, installing better nets, but you know we can be creative about it. And the point is, in each situation, we're deepening our understanding of compassion and wisdom in a way where in a year from now, we might have more creative solutions to the situation and then even more. And we keep deepening that instead of simply deciding that, oh, this simplistic gesture or this simplistic thing is enough. Like if Lopsang says, it's fine to kill the flies, then I can just kill the flies at the end. No, it's never as simple as that. It's always a creative search deep inside us because it's our lives that we will be applying wisdom and compassion to. And we're applying them in the practice of nonviolence, amongst other things. But it is very true that this is a perfect example of a specific situation that we apply the practice of nonviolence to as uh, much as possible. And we see what comes up with regards to creative solutions. Yeah. I found that when I get tired from work, I collapse into myself, and it's difficult to maintain a broad view, including loving kindness. But Noticing this state of mind, settling body, speech, and mind helps to pause the collapsing into myself and work on the four immeasurables. Yeah, that's a very valid and very true observation in that when we're not energe energetically resourced, we're tired, or we've just had a period where we were, where we were too active, activated for a long time, and then we're collapsing, not much space left for sending the four immeasurables out to others. The very valid observation here is, is the, uh, the other very valid observation is that even adding a teeny tiny touch, like just a few moments of settling the body, speech and mind in their natural state, or just the loving kindness for ourselves, not as formal practice where we meditate on something specific, but just a little bit of tenderness towards ourselves and uh, helping our body rest in a nice position on a comfortable bed, if that's available to us. Uh, making sure we drink enough water and so forth. Those small gestures also change the vibe. They change the interdependence of the situation. And teeny tiny points of loving kindness or compassion or joy or equanimity there would in the long run affect the overall experience. And that is also why we generally try to position our formal practice, our formal meditation, as in sitting on a cushion or lying down and meditating, at the point during the day where we are somewhat resourced, where we are still awake and we still have some energy and so forth to do the meditation. But that takes strategic thinking in that uh, we do need to understand our habits, know a little bit about our schedule, our day, and to find that position and also know that we're choosing something 
where we wouldn't constantly be feeling the temptation to skip our practice because we put it at the end of the day and then we're reaching the end of the day. And of course, we no longer have the energy to practice and so forth. And then we feel like a failure or it just feels bad. That being said, of course, even meditation teachers that I'm familiar with sometimes do more practice and sometimes do less because they are also like anybody else can be overworked. And of course, good meditation teachers try to continue with their informal practice throughout the day, still radiating loving kindness and joy and being mindfully aware and so forth throughout the day. But then with regards to formal meditation, well, that depends on so many circumstances that each individual person finds in their life. And that's where the great Yogini of loving kindness, Deepama, that I often refer to, great Yogini of the 20th century, who was also the godmother of the insight meditation movement in the United States, gave a wonderful bit of advice. She said, if you've reached the end of the day and because of outer circumstances, no formal practice has been done, what to do? That happens, of course. At least be mindfully aware of un one in-breath and one out-breath before you fall asleep. And that's so much better than nothing. It still means we care about our practice and we can add an element of mindfulness to our day that way. And then the next day, there'll be more mindful awareness and then more loving kindness and so forth. And it will keep growing. So at least planting that one seed at the very end of the day, it's much better than doing nothing. Not feeling too bad about it, being gentle with ourselves, knowing, hey, there's a lot of factors at work. I too am filled with joy when I think of studying the Brahma, Brahma Viharas. I often simply think of them during the uh, quotidian activities of the day. And I just, and just the thought of them uh, fills me with joy. Wonderful. Yeah, these are some of the, of course, most feel-good practices that are available throughout or across multiple contemplative traditions. But they can also really challenge us in multiple ways to go beyond simply feeling good and sending out rays of love and kindness everywhere because they melt the ice of our mind and transform it into the free-flowing water of awakening, as one great yogi puts it. So, uh, well, Garchan and Pache, whom we referred to before. So um, they're, both, they're both very advanced and very simple and mundane, and that's where the beauty lies. I had an upsetting event and was able to use my practice to return to base and not react in anger. See, and that's, that's a big victory. It's, been, it's a big victory to even notice we got angry uh, and to be aware of that and then to analyze that perhaps. But beyond that, to actually be able to hold that anger and spaciousness, to not succumb to it, to not fully fuse with it, once again, a wonderful thing to congratulate ourselves in uh, on, sorry, and then to continue cultivating kindness that goes beyond that slowly, slowly as we grow. Guess that realizing myself in a karma bubble full of fear and anger and other emotions and habits that I actually want to be free of, just seeing this is already halfway because I am becoming more and more motivated to free myself from these delusional states and to somehow destruct this karma bubble as well. Yeah, and part of the beauty of it is that we know that the karma, the karma bubble of this bubble of experiences that we find ourselves in, this projected lived reality that each one of us find ourselves in, we're all in the center of our bubble of appearances. One beautiful thing about it is just realizing that it is a bubble of appearances. It's real and functional in that we get sick, we get joyful, popcorn tastes nice. Popcorn does not taste nice. This movie is wonderful. This movie is horrible and so forth. All these things feel real. They're functional enough. We can be absolutely heartbroken or incredibly elevated uh, emotionally. That's all true. But in a way, even just knowing, hey, it is a projection. It is a bubble. Is knowing, well, the bubble doesn't independently exist. It is a projection. It's real for me. But it, it's not ultimately real. There's something beyond it. And there's also something at the source of it, something that is projecting it out. And that's my basic goodness. And so the more I go into my basic goodness, the more I access my basic goodness, I connect to my basic goodness, the less fear and anger I will experience in a way, slowly, slowly, especially fear, but fear lies at the root of anger in one way of explaining it. There are other ways also valid, but in one way of explaining it, there is a primordial fear that lies at the root of anger and so forth. And as we access loving kindness and so forth, going deep into that source of the projection, the basic goodness itself, um, that primordial fear slowly starts to give way to 
openness, openness and love. Um, and that's where we find some liberation. I have been feeling in practicing the four measurables and keeping good conduct. Uh, I'm sorry. I've been feeling joy in practicing the four measurables and keeping good conduct. Last week, we began speaking about vows and Panchashila. I've heard that you can, in a sense, take on the vows on your own in front of a Buddha statue. If later on you realize you're not prepared to hold one of the vows, for example, drinking alcohol, alcohol, and you decide to give back that vow in the same way, for example, in front of a Buddha statue or something similar, does that work? In essence, if you realize you need to more work on in order to fully take on a vow after you've already taken it, is there a way to skillfully give back the vow in order to avoid more negative karma? My second question may be more relevant later in the retreat. I've seen the Mani Mantra Meditation Lama Allen's Four Measurables book. Can even a non-Buddhist recite this mantra and have it be beneficial? Or a Buddhist has not had the chance to receive the oral transmission? So I'm going to offer brief answers to these two. Uh, for the first one, there's a lot of fine points that could be discussed uh, could be discussed about the five guidelines, five ethical guidelines, because we can simply talk about them as five good ideas about how to live our life. And that's the level that we're employing in this course, because this course is both for people who are non-believers, full stop, uh, and people who are believers of the Buddhist tradition or maybe multiple other traditions, of course. Uh, absolutely, four measurables are universal. Uh, however, all four measurables rely on some level of nonviolence. So, for that, just knowing, hey, I need to consider my habits with regards to killing and so forth, that's a worthy endeavor. That's supportive. Uh, that's good. And then, if we go into the Buddhist tradition and we have feel the wish to take these four or five guidelines more formally as so called lay precepts, then that uh, ha has some formal logic associated with it. With regards to that, just to answer that very briefly uh, and to not leave you hanging, um, with the five lay precepts, at, at least to everything, uh, in accordance with everything I know about the Tibetan tradition and also the Theravada tradition and also most likely the Far Eastern tradition of, uh, or Eastern Asian tradition of Buddhism, they're only usually really taken from a teacher. Uh, the precepts that can be taken in front of a Buddha statue are of, from a different category. Those are the so-called bodhisattva precepts, which are different from these five general guidelines. Um, so in the Tibetan tradition, it's said that these five precepts that we've discussed as precepts, they're usually taken from a live a teacher in person. In some cases, maybe that's done online these days, but uh, a different level of precepts that have to do with a different level of practice. They are sometimes taken in front of a Buddha statue or a stupa or a holy image and so forth. But when you do take these five precepts from a teacher, you can just take one or two or three or five or uh, four or five. Uh, you decide that ahead of time. And then if you, uh, that's the more formal side of it. In accordance to what my teachers have told me, and I've had a lot of discussions about it, just to understand the nitty gritty sides of it. If you break one of them from the root and one needs to study, what does it mean? How does it happen? Da, 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 da. Uh, then uh, the whole set is broken and you need to retake the whole set or one or two, the, the set that you had or the set that you want to take, maybe just one, maybe two, maybe three and so forth. Or if you have, if you feel like, oh no, uh, the set that I've taken does not work for me, uh, the logic would be to return the whole set and then take another combination. So if maybe you feeling all, all five, I can't keep them, you return them. And then you, for example, take three or four or two or one, depending on what it is. That being said, the precept about not drinking alcohol and so forth, different teachers offer it in different interpretations. So some say no intoxicants at all. Some on occasion say you can have a glass of wine, but you can't get, you shouldn't get drunk and so forth. And there's so many minute details that then can be discussed in a Buddhist context. So I'm not going to dwell on that now. That uh, being said, that's for the second question, anyone and everyone who feels the wish can recite the Om Mani Padme Ho Mantra. You don't have to be a Buddhist to do that. And you also don't need, formally speaking, uh, the oral transmission for that. This mantra comes from a sutra text. So anyone can recite it. That being said, um, sometimes it's mentioned that if you do have the oral transmission, the recitation would feel more powerful for you, for sure, because you're connected to a lineage of realization then. But if that, that hasn't happened, you can absolutely still recite it um, at your leisure. If uh, that feels nice, if you feel inspired by it, then that, that would absolutely be beneficial as well. 
Um, I ask about the money mantra because it feels like a profound way to support the four measurables. And absolutely, yes, it is. So um, anyone and everyone can recite the Om Mani Padme Hum mantra if they like it. And not recite it if they don't. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Yeah. But it's it's one of the so-called one of the mantras that are universally available to anyone and everyone, just like Tara's mantra, medicine mudra mantra, and so forth. If we want and uh, to receive a transmission, if we have, wonderful. If not, for these very general mantras, it's fine to recite them as well. And that's not my idea. That's something that I've heard from my teachers on multiple occasions. Spiritual materialism. Uh, I love the Nepalese handmade paper. Yeah, so do I. It's wonderful, especially when there are cooperatives that take care to source it ethically and then sell it at a fair price and then transfer the income to the makers of the paper and so forth. Also, an act of loving kindness that way. I worked on reflecting on my habitual actions with regards to harming others and those that disturb the tranquility of my mind. I reflected that I uh, am quick to take offense throughout the week. My anger regularly flared up. I also noted my, my internal conversations about things going on in my life. Since I have a rich internal dialogue going on, which I've become more aware of, and I've been attempting to notice when this happens and to turn the volume off on these thoughts. With practice, I will get better at catching myself at this behavior. And I do spend a lot of time having these imaginary conversations. This is what I would most like to change, the judgments that arise about situations and others and how I imagine I would respond. Absolutely fine. And that is absolutely something that can be accomplished through the practices that we're learning here. And also even through the practice that we're already doing of settling body and speech and mind in a natural state. One teacher that I very much respect from the Tibetan Pön tradition, uh, Tenzin Wangil Rinpoche, a contemporary of others, frequently um, teaching in the same, generally speaking, spaces as Lama Alan Wallace and so forth, um, sometimes talks about how settling our body, speech and mind in their natural states uh, or in the natural state is an antidote to what he calls pain body, pain speech and pain mind. And these are in a way states of our body, speech, and mind, which are under the influence of some neurotic energy, when it feels like our body can't rest because it feels neurotically charged and uncomfortable, or our speech, including our inner speech of narrating stories and having dialogues and so forth, under the influence of neurotic energy that makes us perpetuate these narratives or say things that are unkind. And then the same with our mind, our mind just grasping at things, being all over the place, being neurotically charged uncomfortable to live with. So replacing that in the practice of settling body, speech, and mind with stillness for the body, silence for our speech, and spaciousness for our mind. So there's one of the materials for this session. We'll have a recording, which some of you might have seen already, where Denzel Wangler Rinpoche speaks about these three pills, as he calls them, stillness, silence, and spaciousness. That's essentially also the practice of settling body, speech, and mind in the natural state, just described in a slightly different way, but with many, many uh, with very small, uh, actually, differences. And if we notice, hey, my mind is in the pain speech mind, uh, mode right now, it's projecting all these dialogues, I'm still thinking about this, well, releasing that with the out of breath and resting in silence. And first, these moments of silence would be not that strong, not that long, uh, rarely accessible, but it all comes with training. And the training here, fortunately, is not about exerting effort to do something. It's about releasing effort that already goes into those internal conversations and judgments and everything, which would not at all reduce our ability to have ethical judge uh, judgments when necessary uh, with regards to something. I had to put one of the dogs to sleep a few days ago. Even though I didn't do the actual killing, I did agree to it as he was suffering and there was nothing more than could be done to help him. How does this fit with the practice of avoiding killing? Well, once again, uh, were I to offer some ready-made advice or answer, that would not be helpful because were I to say, oh, it's absolutely fine, then there's no further search in a way, but were I to say, oh no, that's killing, that's horrible, how dare, you, how dare, that's also not helpful at all, that's not kind, that's not compassionate, that's not taking all the circumstances into consideration. Instead, what I can say is that we have different considerations that can be applied on a more secular level, and then perhaps on the Buddhist level, and then with those, uh, we consider, hey, well, 
what is the best, most compassionate act, including that would include not killing, not inflicting physical harm and so forth that I can undertake in this situation. So a more secular response and a more Buddhist response that then considers past and future lives and so forth, they might be slightly different, but the important thing is that we continue considering these points. And then in this moment, I think what's very important to point out is that when we do have to take an action like that, that of course for us is deeply painful, for us is deeply hurtful, for us is not an easy decision to make, then before we struggle or as we're struggling with was that the right thing to do and so forth, we take moments to offer ourselves kindness and compassion, to understand we've done the best we could given the situation, to hold ourselves in a warm embrace, to have the support of others around us. And then from that, if five years from now, we would make the same decision or a different decision, that would rely on all the little steps of training that we undertake. But for now, important to also surround ourselves with that warmth and know, hey, what was, what was especially important is that I'm asking myself, hey, is that the best thing to do? Because many people on the planet don't. And it's not that they're bad or evil. It's just as we're considering eudaimonic well-being, we start asking this question of, hey, is that the most skillful thing to do more and more? And that brings more and more joy, more and more commitment, more and more freedom. About an interesting observation of soul size that the fellow just mentioned. Oh, from the point of view of karma, which is worse, to participate with 100 people in the death of a cow, or in the case of vegetarians, to participate in the death of millions of insects, etc., that we cremate in hungry culture. Well, multiple considerations there, and we consider them um, all. Uh, one cow, um, meat eaters also eat vegetarian products, so it's both. And then also vegetarians and vegans also drive cars, so there's insects dying on the road and so forth. And there's just so many things to consider. But the point is not to have any sort of big debate in this case, at least this is not the platform for it, uh, certainly. Uh, the point is um, to sit down, to offer ourselves kindness, to continue working on our wisest and more skillful decisions, and primarily to think about our own decisions right now. Because of course, we do have ethical discernment with regards to what's going on in the world. We do need to vote for someone if our country does have voting, a voting system. We do need to choose which doctor to go to, which doctor is more qualified or more ethical and so forth. We do need to choose which teachers to study with if we are st studying something. So of course we apply that discernment. And yet when we're thinking about eudaimonic well-being, we need to take that tiny step back and think, hey, what would be the most skillful thing for me to do right now? And once again, what we're seeing here is that we are raising these considerations. So that's important. Um, at this stage, at least more important than to point the fingers out. Sometimes despite precautions, I find ourselves in situations where it seems like avoiding killing is almost impossible. For example, when being bitten by ticks, even after applying bug repellents, while having an infestation of ants in a kitchen, even when I've tried to keep it clean, in that case, I try to minimize the harm. And if killing is involved, to do it quickly without anger and with regret while wishing these beings a favorable rebirth. So once again, I'm not gonna comment on the act of killing itself uh, or not killing. What's important is that we're as asking the question, we're trying to find the ethically valuable solutions. And we're trying to move as close to nonviolence as possible. And that's the essence of training in nonviolence. It's not that somehow magically living in this world, we click our fingers and we're totally beyond harming anyone and, every, and anything. That's not how it works. We slowly, slowly make steps towards harming less. And another very important thing to point out is that most of the comments and observations so far have been about killing, but it's in a way even more important or equally important to also consider stealing or taking what is not given and lying and also other unskillful acts of speech. And then of course, also everything that has to do with using our sexuality wisely. That's a very big thing, even though people quite often shy away from just considering it. And then intoxicants, which just do not at all boil down to simply alcohol or uh, recreational drugs and so forth. We can be intoxicated by the television or by TikTok or by social media or by just some very weird conversations that we're having with friends that we're living in a very strange mental state that can be harmful to us or others. So to consider all of that and see, hey, how can I bring more wisdom, compassion, and clarity into all of this is the essence of this first step. 
Um, apropos, apropos of spiritual materialism, do you believe that having devotional images can sometimes lead to an attachment and even a form of idolatry, as in the Mosaic Ten Commandments, graven images? I think and the point is not, oh, can it lead to? Probably does, but we, we misuse everything and anything. The point is, if we do own sacred images, and I do own a few, uh, we remind ourselves that they represent beautiful qualities, including the four measurables. And that's what makes them valuable tools for our practice. So if we do have some images around us, with us, in our little purse, in our big suitcase, I know people who have been traveling with big images. I know people who have a teeny tiny images on their keychain uh, or symbol, or even a tattoo in some cases, just something that reminds them about love. Just having the word love somewhere on your body, maybe that's what uh, some people have, but knowing, hey, it, the important thing is that all of this represents a quality. What can I do with that quality? Well, I can appreciate it. That's where it all starts. It starts with appreciating the qualities, knowing that they are important, but then I can either cultivate that quality, that's the cultivation approach, or I can discover the quality. Maybe it's already there deep in my nature. And either way, either way is fine, beautiful, wonderful, and necessary. So I'm very grateful for all the observations you've offered so far. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, all of this has been very pertinent and I hope my responses have been somewhat helpful and it's encouraging. Uh, the last thing I want to do is to discourage anyone from these practices. And um, in the spirit of what we discussed in our first session, I would suggest we just take a five minute break right now so that we can freshen up. And in exactly five minutes, we're gonna come back and continue going into the material for this specific session. So please take good care of your body in these five minutes and we will be right back uh, in just a few minutes. Thank you. Hello again, uh, just for context, we just took a five minute break to make sure everyone can run to the bathroom, get some water and so forth as was requested uh, in our first session. I think it's a very valid request. Of course, we do need to be uh, kind and considerate, but sometimes that depends on the flow. So if we're having a long journaling pause, for example, somewhere, or even a group discussion, then that offers the opportunity to take, uh, take a quick break there. Um, in the situation where we have a lot of slides to go to uh, through or something like that, then, and when it's available, then we do take a little uh, break. So yes, sometimes, um, trying to do our best with what's available. And of course, all in the spirit of being kind to our body and kind to everyone else, all we can hope for. With that, um, let's look at back at the original hypothesis that we have mentioned. It's a hypothesis put forth by the Buddha and uh, describing the three types of inner training, or as Bob Thurman calls it, three types of education that we use on our body, speech, and mind. And our mind here includes our emotions, our intuition, our heart, everything, just our mental energy in general. So we gradually apply some gentle training to all of the gentle as in, this is not a movie about overcoming struggles and training ourselves to become the best warrior in the universe and then defeating evil. It could be seen through that lens and then sometimes actually described that way um, but at the same time, there is a lot of gentleness uh, in how we go about it. And I think in this case, for the four immeasurables course, it actually makes a lot of sense to be gentle about. So gentle training as we steer on the first level, our body, speech, and mind towards harming ourselves and others less. And that's the essence of nonviolence, gently steering ourselves gently teaching ourselves, gently teaching our mental energy, our verbal energy, our physical energy to be less harmful and to be more helpful, bring more happiness, bring less suffering. Not by being human pleasers, that does not at all guarantee that there's more happiness and less suffering in the world, by, but by combining common sense, and that's wisdom, and genuine kindness, genuine benevolence, so that slowly, slowly, we see ourselves, for example, succeeding in the five trainings, the Panchashila, and so forth. Uh, and not just that, it does not boil down to Panchashila, but these are five good ideas about where to begin this gentle steering towards nonviolence, less harm, more benefit, and so forth. 
then we with the second step there's also some gentle steering happening there and that's gentle steering towards greater mental stability or mental coherence that's the training in samadhi and what is that well we take the mental energy that we possess the mind all of its bursting bur <laughs> the energy that it has all the chaos in it, all the chaotic thoughts and the emotions and the images and the memories and everything that's happening all at once. We take some of it and we gradually, gradually try to get reel it in so that it becomes more pliant, it becomes more fit, it becomes a better tool at our disposal that we can use to experience more happiness and less suffering and that we can bring more happiness and bring less suffering. So how we do that is, of course, by using the appropriate techniques. And that's what we're going to discuss today briefly. That was, of course, the topic of the second and third chapters in our quote-unquote root text, The Four Immeasurables by Dr. Alan Wallace, the book. And then with a third step, which is described at the end of the book, but actually, of course, deserves many book of its own. And there are multiple books, dozens, hundreds of books on this topic in the Buddhist tradition, of course, also in the secular mindfulness movement. But with the third step, we take our basic level of common sense, our basic ability to see connections between things, to see how things are organized, to see how things work, and we apply effort to cultivate that clarity of vision so that when we look out, there, out at the reality of this bubble of karmic appearances, and when we look at ourselves, our person, and we look at our mind and everything that's happening in there, and also we look at our body, that's also important. When we look at all of these different things that we can look at, different objects, and also the subject experiencing them, we see all of that with much greater clarity, as if suddenly for the first time, we're seeing things we didn't see before, but that truly exist. And we're no longer seeing things that we have been previously projecting, we had been previously projecting, but actually that don't exist in reality. So developing that clarity of cognition or clarity of vision. The practices of the four immeasurables that we're going to be doing uh, rely on the first training in ethical discipline. Uh, that's a necessary support for them. And they support ethical discipline. Of course, the more the kinder we become, the more we'd be able to support uh, our practice our, men, our formal practice or our meditation practice of loving kindness and so forth. That's uh, obvious. But the formal trainings and the four measurables as in meditations on them, meditations on loving kindness, meditations on compassion and so forth, primarily lie in the category of mental stability or coherence. And in fact, all of the four measurables can be used for cultivating incredible levels of mental coherence. That's how they have been traditionally taught in the uh, Pali tradition or Pali lineage, or the lineage that relies on Pali texts in Buddhism, also largely in the Sanskrit tradition as well, and also in the modern mindfulness movement. There's no shortage of teachers who, yes, teach practices like mindfulness of breathing to cultivate mental stability, um, or observing the body to cultivate mental stability and so forth. But beyond that, also add at least some strokes of loving kindness in some cases, also compassion, and in some cases, all of the four measurables are taught there as well, either as supportive techniques, because they do support uh, the mind in being stable, or as primary techniques for cultivating mental stability. Because, of course, it's one thing to have some kind thoughts arising in our mind and then dispersing and then being distracted while we're doing that. And that's how it is uh, initially, no shame in that at all. But that's different from having laser-like concentration on boundless loving kindness that is radiated every which way. Uh, and some practitioners in history are praised or have been praised for reaching that especially profound state of concentration on the basis of loving kindness. And of course, there, there have been hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of practitioners like that throughout history. We can absolutely join their ranks. But uh, during the times of the Buddha, there were a few individuals that have been recorded uh, for future generations to be masters of loving kindness as a technique for cultivating concentration. And then when we look back at their example, in addition to the teachings of the Buddha himself, who very clearly described how to use loving kindness, how to use compassion, use compassion and so forth, we say, hey, if I do find that inspiring, I can become just like them. 
Why? We have the same teeny tiny Buddha sitting in the heart of our atom. So we can do the same thing if we want to. And hope, why would we want to? To cultivate inner resources. Why do we need that? For eudaimonic well-being, which will then radiate out, support our hedonic well-being as well. The choices that we make about whom to marry, where to work, where to live, what to eat, how to treat insects in our kitchen and so forth. The hedonic level of interacting with our reality would be supported by this radiating out eudaimonic glow. Um, and that's why we do it. And of course, eudaimonic glow radiates by its nature. So it affects the benefit. It is the benefit that we're able to bring others, especially when we do it deliberately or also when we're quite advanced, the benefit that we bring spontaneously without even thinking, we just make everyone's lives better. And that's something we can aspire for. How, wouldn't that be wonderful? For me, one day, with any action of body, speech, and mind that I do, any movements of my body where I move things around, I go around, I eat, I cook, all that, all the movements of my speech, meaningful speech, skillful speech, kind speech, wise speech, and all the movements of my mind, not plotting revenge or something like that, or inventing new biological weapons and so whatever it is that our mind can be put to in terms of harming beings. Not that, but truly being peaceful and loving or being calm and loving. Like once again, Deepama, whose mind, whose state of mind, according to her own very humble confession, was just silence and kindness. As in, no swirling of stories, no swirling, no story swirling around as in like, I should have done this and all of that that we know so well. None of that, but clear, radiant silence that could have been at any point used to benefit someone in a skillful manner. That's, okay, of course, also a spontaneous way of benefiting others with our mind. Whatever is necessary, the best response, the best bit of advice, the best, way of, or the best way of attending to someone, spontaneously crystallizing in the spaciousness that we have become. And even though to outsiders, it would seem like we have this, we still have this body, and maybe to us as well, we might have, still have that body. But that body would just be a tool, an energetic tool to doing something good for others. That's the working hypothesis, this same working hypothesis, but centered around the practices like loving kindness and so forth. That's totally available to us. And we have many examples in front of us in recent history and ancient history and so forth. We learn about them to increase, to strengthen our mandala of uh, inspiration, just like we use our teeny tiny notebook with inspiring quotes. And some of those quotes are, are life-saving quotes, as in what, to, what would remind me about inner serenity or long-lasting vision, uh, vision, global vision, when I feel lost in my mental language. And in some cases, what would remind me to be more generous to others and so forth, all of that supporting us, just like the examples of the great masters of the past. So within that, talking about the practice of samadhi or cultivating mental coherence, mental gathering, mental gatheredness, uh, mental concentration, mental stability, we would very frequently see this term, especially uh, if we're, of course, reading books by Dr. Alam Wallace, but also if we're reading books by the Dalai Lama or many other Buddhist masters of the Tibetan tradition or of the Pali tradition. Uh, so, of course, all the masters coming from the lineages, the noble lineages that have developed and have been preserved in uh, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, Burma, Laos, Cambodia, and so forth, and also many masters from uh, East Asian uh, Buddhist lineages as well. This is where we'd see these two terms specifically. Practices like this absolutely are included in all the great wisdom traditions of the world. There are concentration practices in Christianity, for sure, certainly in Sufism and so forth. The list goes on and on and in the modern mindfulness movement. But I just want to spend a few moments on this term itself because it will, we'll see it in the book and we'll see it again and again. And we did see if we have read the chapter, the second chapter. But we'll also see it around quite a while. And in some cases, we will see this term translated and then used in translation. So a common translation, I think originally coming from Jeffrey Hopkins, is calm abiding, which is the literal translating for the Tibetan version of the same term. Shi, ne. Shi means peaceful. Ne means abiding. And so shi, ne becomes peaceful abiding, calm abiding, tranquil abiding, serene abiding. 
And the same uh, etymological division can be also applied for these uh, terms. Sanskrit on the left, shamata, and uh, samata uh, in Pali, same kind of division into two subroots. But then there are other translations that we would see in some cases like just serenity, or again, serene abiding, practice of serenity, and so forth. So these are different sort of synonyms, all synonyms, calm abiding, shamatha, and so forth. You'd see them quite a while. But what does it refer to, all of this? A multiplicity of different translations and terms. Two different things could be implied. One is a specific level of concentration, a specific realization on the path to cultivating concentration. So that's a very advanced stage, actually. And if some of you have ever read Dr. Wallace's book, Attention Revolution, you would know that in that book, and it's not a required reading for this course. So I'm just mentioning this in passing, but you don't need to read this for this course specifically, maybe in the future, but it will be included in the notes that we send out at the end of the course for what else to explore for to support our practice greatly. You don't need to read it for this course because also the same idea is covered in chapters two and three of our book, Four Measurables. But that's a specific concentration state that we develop after going through many, many steps in mental training. And it's very advanced, it's very precise, it's very profound, it's very peaceful, and it's very transformative when we reach it. But it is in a way a tall order, as in, wow, when we read those books and we read the two chapters, we see, oh, I have to go through many steps to reach uh, that stage. And um, that's one aspect of it. And uh, the other aspect uh, is to talk about the practices that lead us there. And that's the second meaning here. So shamatha is quite a lot of, uh, most of the time, actually, when we say I'm practicing shamatha, it doesn't mean we're resting on that advanced level already. It means we're using the methods the different concentration methods, the different concentration practices that would eventually, were we to invest enough time, have all the right conditions, apply enough effort, lead us to that advanced state. But if we don't go towards that advanced state, still using these practices just helps us cultivate greater attentional stability, improve our attentional skills, improve our attentional balance. And you would see different psychologists and different Authors working in this field use different terms for that. The muscles of attention, attentional skills, attentional balance, and so forth. All of these are more or less obvious in that we know, hey, it's about my ability to rest on an object, to concentrate on a task, to not just be um, distracted all the time. And so that's where we gather our mental energy into something like that's more laser-like, as opposed to very a very broad spot of light that is yet very imprecise and we can barely, still barely see anything when we direct it. So a very simple explanation of this is if we try to concentrate on a task like writing an important email, we open our Gmail account and we see that we've received 10 different letters. Some of them are spam. Some of them are invitations to join this sale and buy this newest outfit that we have been looking at before. And then of course they've registered and they sent us the very right email for that, all of that happening. So we open the Gmail account and instead of going to new mail, starting the email, writing it, sending it out and doing all that in three minutes and then escaping. And our email account is relatively safe compared to social media. Still, even there, we manage, we somehow manage to get stuck, to lose ourselves in uh, browsing all these sales. And then four hours later, the email is still not sent out and we're trying to locate ourselves in space and time. Hey, where am I? Well, as we cultivate shamatha skills along with everything else that we do, cultivating an understanding of few demonic well-being, offering loving kindness to ourselves and others, da, 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 da. the more we cultivate concentration skills, the higher are the chances that would be able to efficiently focus on a task and complete it without getting distracted too much. And that's the small, but very practical and very powerful improvement that we start with. Yes, in the long run, it's these profound concentration states, incredibly powerful and transformative. On the basic level, it's just indeed being able to let go of some of the recurring stories with greater grace and ease and elegance. Hey, 
letting it go. And not just because the song tells us to let it go, but because we can. We have cultivated the ability to hold when necessary, release when not necessary. And that's what shamatha pertains to or revolves around. Remo releasing things we don't need, gently holding on to the thing that we do need. And this is where it's helpful to, in addition to the concept of shamatha, to introduce some other concepts that we would be working with a lot when talking about all of the four immeasurables. So we'll very gently go through some of these terms and concepts and we'll try to imagine them, we'll try to apply them to our experience because out of these building blocks, in a way, conceptualism, like these are words we need to understand them, out of them, we'll build the building of the four immeasurables and we, it will be quite uh, nice to, quite easy actually to build the building of the four measurables if we understand this basic concept. At least that's my experience and also how I've been trained. So I'm inviting you on this little journey through a few words that seem simple, but we hear them in Buddhist texts all the time, certainly. And when we understand them to a certain degree in a on a practical level in terms of our experience, they become very, very powerful building blocks for anything else that we want to accomplish. So the first term here is awareness. And uh, of course, since we have such a diverse group in terms of everyone has different experience with the con great contemplative traditions of the world and the m popular mindfulness and so forth, uh, and some people are, might feel as if they're complete beginners, which is never true because we're never beginners in terms of loving kindness and compassion. If we have survived so far, we do have some, and we have certainly extended some loving kindness and compassion to other people and other beings in our lives. So we're never beginners in any way whatsoever, but we're reviewing some of the key terms together. And that's a fun thing to do. But um, I'm going to describe these terms as if we all were beginners. So we can use the concept of beginner's mind now. As if we are beginners, we're looking at these words and trying to see, hey, what does it mean? So awareness is described as the basic foundational function of consciousness or mind. So we all know or at least we suspect strongly, we have a mind, uh, we have mental, at this mental level of energy, we have mental energy, we have awareness, we have consciousness, we have the ability to know. So there is something in us that is thinking and feeling and doing, we, we sometimes divide it into mind and heart. That's not really the division used in the Buddhist tradition. So we're not going to be talking about that at all. This is my mind, this is my heart, there are thoughts, not really a thing in most dharmic traditions that I'm familiar with, not in Buddhism, not in the multiple lineages of Hinduism either. So we're not gonna be talking about that division. Instead, we can say we have the physical energy where you know, we move around, we drive cars, we buy cabbages, that's fun. Then uh, we have our vocal energy and sometimes that includes the breath, but that's also our, just our ability to make noises, to sing karaoke to say meaningful things, to recite poems, to say prayers, to give inspiring speeches that bring about social change. All of that, verbal energy, wonderful. Or very harmful when we use it to constantly skinny shame our child and then they grew up feeling horrible about their body. That's harmful. That's not the most outrageous crime that can be committed with our speech, but somewhat harmful, we know that. So multiple things, good, bad, constructive, destructive, all of that energy. And then the mind. The part of us that sees, experiences, thinks, plans, wishes, and feels sad as well. There is sadness reflected in the body, but the primary part of us that feels sadness, that is in a mode of sadness, that's the mind. So how is mind different from matter when Buddhists talk about the mind? Well, the incredible function that the mind or consciousness has is just the ability to know something, to be aware. And there is a formal definition there, ability to register the presence of an object and the feature of an object. So, for example, uh, to use, oh, sorry, let me fix my lamp. It's getting kind of dark in here. So the ability to register the presence of an object and its features. So, for example, when I move this cup into the frame, and it's a nice uh, little Nepali cup. Uh, well, not that little, but 
relatively, and it has flowers and leaves on it. First, you register the very presence of something in the frame. There was already something called Lopsang Tenpa. There were the images behind me, the wall, the, the back of the couch, and so forth. But then you saw that something moved in, in, it moved into the frame. You registered, oh, there's something. And then also with the same ability, you then register, oh, it has this shape, it has these colors. He holds it in a specific way. He calls it a cup. Most likely it's a cup. It's a cup. Yay. It's all of that, registering different features of it and then also interpreting it by thinking it's a nice cup. No, it's a horrible cup. Why would anyone want a cup like that? I only like cups like, that looks like this. Da, 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 da. So everything that we know about this cup and just registering the presence of the cup are different expressions of this ability. Just the ability to know very simply. No, no complicated uh, things that we need to do. And once again, to refer to uh, the wonderful and very famous meditation master Mingi Rinpoche, and I've primarily studied with his brothers, but I have also had the privilege to translate for him as well on occasion. He often gives this very simple exercise to prove that we have awareness. You just understood, you knew directly, even before you had to think he raised the hand, that there was hand raising on my behalf. So you saw the hand being raised. If you do have my video open, if you're looking at the video. So knowing that there's a raised hand here is an expression of your awareness. And beyond that, a part of that awareness also knew that you knew. There was a part of the mind that knew the, that was cognizing, knowing the hand. And a little part of the mind that also knew, hey, I know that he raised the hand. So if I asked you, which one of you realized that I raised the hand? You would all say, yeah, I did notice the hand, raising of the hand, which means that something was also observing what was happening in the mind. And then there's a lot of technical discussion about, well, how exactly was it observing? Was it in the same moment? Was it later? Is it a different part of the mind, different layer of the mind? We don't need to go into all of that at all for this, these practices. What we do need to know is that, hey, I have this basic ability to know to understand, to realize, to notice. And I can do something with that ability. What is this ability usually cognizing? Well, it's something that in our group chat has already been referred to as the karmic bubble uh, or the bubble of appearances. In, and it's a very simple thing. The word karmic should not confuse us in this case. It's just knowing that I wake up in the morning and I'm surrounded by stuff. I find myself in this little movie of my life where I'm in the middle. And uh, as if I am a movie character, I move through, through this stuff, the cups, the tables, the people, the situations, the heartbreak, the joy. So today I woke up and then uh, I had, uh, I don't remember what I did today, honestly, there, there goes mindfulness. Well, no, I woke up and I had some food and then I had a meeting with friends and did, 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 did. so I can restore some details about this little movie. Well, everything that I was observing as this, little spherical movie theater. The, it all consists of appearances or holograms that my mind knows. That doesn't mean that actual physical cups don't exist and physical walls and physical bodies of friends and so forth. No, it's just to cognize them. And this is a conclusion that would be shared by many cognitive sciences as well. My mind creates holograms and cognizes that through the prism of that hologram. So there are certainly atoms and so forth of this cup but what my mind sees is not directly the atoms, it's a restored holographic image of it. And I can have all sorts of attitudes towards this holographic image. And there are also holographic images in my mind that are imaginary and while they, while they exist, they, they, there are no atoms behind them. For example, I can imagine an orange in my hand right now. It's imaginary, but I can certainly imagine it. And actually if I imagine it strong enough or I imagine biting into a lemon, it would affect my body. So it does have power. And yet it's a mental appearance which doesn't have atoms behind it. And it is absolutely real and functional in that I am indeed imagining lemon, biting into a lemon. I'm having the reaction and so forth. So that's what our mind deals with. It has this awareness side and it has the side which creates these holograms. And this is where this very traditional definition, but very important in a way, even though we might feel a bit unsure about it initially. But it's actually quite important for the four measurables if we want to build them on a firm foundation. The definition that just describes what the mind is, or consciousness, in this case, these are synonyms. Mind is that which is clear and knowing. 
clear and that it's immaterial. There is also the brain, but the brain is a correlate of the mind, uh, certainly in this worldview, in that they're very strongly interconnected. You can uh, do things to the brain and that would affect the mind. But the switch uh, and uh, the light uh, that comes from the lamp, they're not fully synonymous. They're just correlated to each other. So I'm, I'm not, we're not going to go deeply into that. Of course, those of you who have studied with Alan uh, Wallace have received very, very precise explanations on this point to the interplay between mind and brain and so forth. In this case, we're just talking about the, the mental side of things, as in I have this mind and it can give rise to mental holograms. Let's all now imagine an orange right in front of us, floating in space. Okay, some people would have clearer visualization. For some, it would appear more vaguely. We're all different that way, and we have different training with regards to visual thinking. But we can at least all think, oh, there's orange in front of me. Okay, some, some general spot of blotch of orangeness might appear there. That's more than enough. That's a mental appearance. And there are many more mental appearances, which include verbal thoughts. I love cookies. That's an appearance. Just a verbal appearance, it's made of words. Or memories. Mm. Yesterday I had this divine carrot cake, perhaps we're thinking. And we're sort of flashing back to that situation. That's a mental appearance. That's the incredible power of our mind. And within this incredible creative power, we can do things deliberately to transform our experience. For example, we can generate the ideas about different sentient beings and then manipulating our ability to know them, how we know sentient beings. We can shape our mind into the attitude of loving kindness towards these sentient beings arising in the field of our awareness. And that's exactly why we're discussing this whole definition, why we're discussing awareness, why we're discussing appearances. In the practice of loving kindness and compassion and empathetic joy and equanimity, what we do is we take this raw energy of awareness, just the basic ability to know, hey, I know there's a cup. Now I know there's no cup. Now there's cup again. Now no cup again. We take this very basic ability as if it, was, as if it were clay and we shape it. And what we make out of it, and yes, we can then discuss in detail how would that look from the point of view of cultivation? How would that look from the point of view of discovery? These two approaches. We're going to go into that later. But basically, out of this foundational energy, comes, there comes the refracted light of loving kindness, or compassion, or equanimity, or empathetic joy. And there are many other types of refracted awareness or uh, modulated awareness that are available to us, such as anger, or appreciation, or incredible craving and greed, or fear, or jealousy about the object maybe i'm showing you a cup and you're feeling appreciation that's one form of your modulated awareness almost instinctively of course you took the clay of your awareness and you shaped it into a form or into you gave that light the color that we call appreciation hey lovely cup that's one of the messages that i very kindly received i love the love the nepali cup it said wonderful but maybe someone's awareness got refracted into disgust. That's also a ray. One of their common emotions. Ew, gross. There are butterflies on this cup. Butterflies are creepy. No, put it away. Something like that. Most of the time, when we are not training consciously, our awareness goes into these modes automatically without much conscious control from our side. So then it's as if we are a little robot or a little app or a little machine where, depending on our previous habituation, depending on our habits and our acculturation and our conditioning, and of course, for Buddhists, a lot of that condition comes from past lives and also from the beginningless times. Most of the time, we re uh, re react to everything in very limited ways. So one very important reaction uh, that is described in the teachings about the four measurables, and we're going to work with it a lot, is that for people who seem lovely and who are kind to us and nice in all sorts of ways, our awareness transforms into affectionate, affectionate attachment. 
So like, yeah, come closer, spend time with me. I like you. Let's do stuff together. So that's our instinctive transformation there. And it has an element of loving kindness to it as well. But a lot of it is also, yes, please come closer. Stay with me. Don't ever leave me. All of that. Then for people who we find the dangerous, or we know they're dangerous because they've hurt us deliberately or not deliberately, we have the energy of apprehension, not so sure, fear, contempt, anger, even hatred. I want to destroy you, what you have done to my family, da 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 Absolutely, that is one of the reactions. And our awareness is shaped into that way. <whistles> Happens almost instinctively. And then to transform it into something else, that would take a lot of work. That's why even though the Christian tradition does say that we do need to love our enemies, it in no way implies that it's very simple. Of course, it's a lot of inner work that goes into that to cultivate that depth of compassion. And also to not confuse that very profound compassion that is loving your enemies with just letting them do whatever and destroy the world. That's also not the point, of course. But yeah, that would take a lot of work to take that ray of light and transform it into something else. And with most people that we meet, also most animals, insects, birds, sea animals, maybe other beings, if you um, think they exist, invisible beings that are described in Buddhism and other traditions, for example. For most beings, our light remains relatively neutral, and that's sometimes described as just indifference. So we register that they're there, but in some cases, we care more about this cup than about those beings. The cashiers at the supermarket, most people on the street, huh, whatever, you know, as long as they don't bump into me or do something to me, as long as they don't appear to be useful or harmful, eh, whatever. So then what uh, the practices of the four measurables are is taking all of this energy and reshaping it in very major ways so that actually towards all beings, whether they're potentially dangerous or potentially lovely or just neutral, appearing neutral in our mind as appearances, they're all also appearances to our mind, we direct towards all of them four interconnected types of awareness, loving and kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. We take the basic energy of our awareness and we shape it into, in one way or another, through discovery or through cultivation, we'll learn both styles. We shape it into a ray that's called loving kindness, a ray that's called compassion, a ray that's called empathetic joy, and a ray that's called equanimity. And that's why in some meditations, actually, we use visualizations like that, sending actual imaginary rays of loving kindness. Not because necessarily we're really sending some energy uh, in the same way that we would on a physical level, were we to try and cut through a diamond using a laser ray. Not necessarily that. It's just a helpful image to remind us that our awareness can be focused and focused in a specific way. It can cognize these beings through the lens of loving kindness, through the lens of compassion, through the lens of empathetic joy, through the lens of equanimity. Or another metaphor, which I very much love, and you would um, um, hear about it a lot in this course as well, <laughs> until we get tired, but I think it's very helpful, is to say we can look at all these beings with the eyes of loving kindness, with the eyes of compassion, with the eyes of empathetic joy, with the eyes of equanimity. And these are actually not all the eyes that are available to us because we also have the eyes of multiple forms of wisdom. Eyes of the wisdom of impermanence, eyes of the wisdom of interdependence, and so forth, many others as well. And we also have the eyes of empathy. That's even before loving kindness and so forth. We need some empathy first. I'm going to talk about it as well. But all of those, all of these eyes, what sees through them is the same basic function, awareness. And we don't need to think of it as something more than it is necessarily. Some people do associate it with soul or spirit and so forth, depending on the tradition. But in Buddhism, all of those are necessary, not necessary. It's just enough to say our consciousness is always aware. It always has this function. It's an, a basic building block of all of our experiences. And we can work with it skillfully and have lots of fun to do with it. Uh, when, I say, when I say eyes, I mean eyes, yes through the eyes of loving kindness, as if we are looking 
through our physical eyes, we're looking at objects like cups. We're seeing their colors and shapes. That's what physical eyes register, colors and shapes. With our inner eyes of perception, we can see beings as lovable and deserving of happiness, as deserving of freedom from suffering and so forth. And that's where we start talking about the immeasurables individually. But before that, before we go into the four, into the four immeasurables, let's talk about another form of awareness that is very necessary for all these practices. And that is shamatha itself. So shamatha, the practice uh, that leads us to mental balance and the end result of it, which is the realization of shamatha and all the levels of mental stability. That's also progressing through all those stages is once again, playing with the energy of our awareness in skillful ways. We're shaping something out of it. But to progress through these stages, to develop greater concentration, and also to progress through the stages of for measurables, and these are not two different paths. We can absolutely use loving kindness to go towards the goal of shamatha. Some people do that. Some people are more inspired by their methods. Either one is absolutely fine. But to progress in all of that, we would use two more shapes that we can use with regards to our awareness or two more colors that we can turn our awareness into. And you would see them described, of course, in the second and third chapters of our book. You would see them always referenced in um, Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist teachings about cultivating concentration and just about Tibet, in Tibetan Buddhist teachings on different types of practices in general. So one of them is called mindfulness. And this is where, of course, mindfulness being such a big buzzword, I would like to, from the very beginning, say that we're going to be using a more traditional definition that comes from the great Indian monastic universities, which is slightly different from the more popular definition that we learn from such luminaries as John Kabat-Zinn, uh, and even from many, uh, on occasion, many insight meditation teachers uh, in America and elsewhere, where they use this definition of moment by moment, non-judgmental, intentional awareness of everything that's arising, usually in the moment itself. That's a very helpful thing. It's a very helpful shape to give uh, our awareness. We could mold our awareness into this, and it would be so powerful, so healing, so wonderful, which is why there's so much research about, and more research coming and coming and coming, about how this popular mindfulness is a very useful tool for stress release, ergo the method of mindfulness-based stress release, for dealing with addic addictions, depression and so forth, and depression and so forth, and therefore, we have modalities of mindfulness-based cognitive training and so forth. Many different, uh, as, as I've said, modalities of teaching this skill of moment-by-moment, non-judgmental, intentional awareness of everything that's arising. Essentially, being here now, as Ramdas famously put it. Being here now in order to have greater calm, greater serenity, greater joy in our life, feel more at ease. And who could say that's not a worthy goal? Anything that helps people not kill themselves, quite honestly. Anything that helps people feel joyful, radiant, at ease, present, compassionate, and so forth. Of course, such a wonderful thing, which is why when talking uh, with the Dalai Lama and presenting this idea and the related training as the results of it and so forth, and, uh, when John Kabat-Zinn was doing that, the response he got from the Dalai Lama was that it's very helpful. We just don't need to call it Buddhism because it can exist on its own. It is derived from Buddhism, for sure, in terms of John Kabat-Zinn's own training, for example, with his teachers. And some of his teachers are also my teachers, uh, such as Chikanim Rinpoche and others. But that's just one of the multiple approaches and one of the multiple definitions for mindfulness, perhaps. Here, we would be using the more traditional uh, definition that comes from the great Indian universities that existed from around second century, uh, CE to the 10th or 11th century CE, and sometimes they arose earlier, sometimes they were destroyed later, but in general, that golden age of psychological studies in ancient India, where they defined mindfulness, and that definition is still very much used by the Tibetan contemplative tradition, Indo-Tibetan contemplative tradition. Mindfulness here is simply refer referred to or uh, described as non-forgetfulness with regards to a previously familiar object. So just not forgetting about something for a period of time. 
Um, Dr. Wallace sometimes uses the definition of bearing in mind. And of course, when we are in the UK and we hear things like mind your head or mind a step and things like that, that's where it means. Bear in mind that there is a ledge uh, or something that could potentially pre present danger. It doesn't refer to non judgmentally, intentionally, moment by moment, be aware of the fact that there is a step there. No, just don't forget, there's a step, be careful. So that's what it means here. And the difference is, one major difference, is that this second type of, uh, second definition of mindfulness, which is the one we're going to be using, non-forgetfulness, essentially. It can refer to an object from the past. So I can be mindfully aware of an event from the past, right? So many Christians, uh, so many Catholics specifically, uh, practice a wonderful meditation tradition called the rosary. And when they do the meditations on the rosary, they're mindfully aware of specific events from the life of Jesus and his mother. So they're focused, for example, as they're reciting a certain number of prayers on the birth of Jesus. They're mindful of the birth of Jesus for that duration of time, which would probably be at least 30, 40, 50 seconds, and they switch to the next event for a minute or two or more, depending on how long it is, and so forth. So those things happened in the past. We could say, yes, in a way, all sacred stories occur in the same time, beyond time, da -di -da. that's important. But in this case, it's an event from the past, or mindful awareness can be focused on the future, which is why Buddhists of some traditions meditate on their future awakening. It hasn't happened yet. Maybe it's 70 billion years away, or maybe less, hopefully less, but maybe it's 70 billion years away. And yet we do, in some practices in the Buddhist tradition, focus on our, as Dr. Alex Burson describes it very elegantly and slightly confusingly, not yet happening future awakening, essentially an event from the future. In the future, I will become a Buddha. So I'm focusing on that. Possible, absolutely, with this type of mindfulness. Not possible with the first one, because the first one is present-centered, with good reason. It's helpful to be staying in the present. Being here now became popular. The book became popular for a very good reason. But in this case, it's not that. It's bearing in mind. And uh, so non-forgetfulness with regards to an object. And then some texts, some uh, psychological manuals from this tradition, which is very old and yet very, very, very robust, still used for practice and for mental healing quite a lot. And some uh, manuals add to a previously cognized wholesome object. So being stuck, uh, for example, on thoughts about, oh, this happened yesterday and we had this fight. Uh, we could say it's sort of the same part of our mind doing that, the same non-forgetfulness. But then to differentiate that just being stuck in the past or obsessed about the future from something that we do in a wholesome, helpful manner, the definition mindfulness is of mindfulness, the one that's helpful, the helpful mindfulness, the mindfulness that helps us progress and heal ourselves and be kind and cultivate for measurables and become awakened, then it is applied to only focusing on something, non being non-forgetful with regards to something that is helpful. That's the definition of wholesome. Something that's helpful for you, dynamic well-being. Um, um, question here, there are meditation traditions that emphasize undertaking both types of mindfulness at the same time. For example, Chuladasa, in order to increase the power of consciousness, the risk of distracting us, I wonder if you could make any comment about this. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, we can master both. We can use both. We can combine both. We can use one of them. It's fine. Some people learn about the popular mindfulness of and just practice that with good results. Some people only learn about the classical definition. The modern one did not exist for a long time in terms of actually being present in some written texts, at least. Uh, some scholars think that the first definition here only developed in late 19th century and so forth. So there are debate about that, different historical opinions. But we could say that maybe for a long time, people only learned about the second one and practiced primarily that. And yet, in a way, we could say, because it's so general and basic, it would eventually also lead us to the results described or brought about by the first type anyway. 
So of course, there are multiple approaches and multiple, multiple ways of describing all of this. That's absolutely fine. In this case, I'm at least trying to present a coherent uh, model that has been passed on to me. Uh, and I'm just putting it on the slides, facilitating the discussion around it in a way where it would not be too confusing and that we would, where we would know, hey, this non-forgetfulness in one of, the, one of the shapes of awareness we could use. Why do we use it? To cultivate concentration, to cultivate mental stability. So non-forgetfulness is one of these shapes we can use of awareness. Another supporting shape should accompany this type of mindfulness that we're talking about. And is if you read, or you will read the second chapter and the third chapter in the book uh, for measurables, you would see references to both side by side, mindfulness and introspection, the power couple of meditation. Um, a question here, I'll just briefly uh, refer uh, to it in the chat. Non-forgetfulness could easily transform into grasping, a kind of negative side of this. Well, actually, uh, if grasping were to occur, there would be other mental functions added to just non-forgetfulness itself. So it's not just non-forgetfulness itself. Other things get added to it. For example, if we get stuck on our greed towards an object, there's also the function of greed, uh, appreciating the object, uh, over-exaggerating the object and so forth. So it's a whole symphony of different shades of awareness coming together. But the important part of it is simply asking ourselves, is the type of awareness that I'm practicing right now that I'm in, is my mental state right now helpful for well-being, not helpful for well-being? And that's where uh, the main distinction lies. HHDL reminds us, reminds us that contemporary worldly conventional mindfulness may be helpful in our contemporary lives, but we shouldn't confuse this type of mindfulness with the Buddhist meaning of it. Absolutely, that's why I just described the difference exactly for that reason. And yet, I, I think there's fine balance between simply seeing the difference between them and uh, going into a slightly judgmental mode about them, which is something that I've seen Buddhists do on occasion. And that's where I, for myself, that's how I deal with this conundrum. I'm obviously a Buddhist, a practicing monastic and so forth. Then I remind myself, there's still no shortage of Buddhists that kill themselves because their practice is not yet strong enough to deal with all types of suicidal thoughts, for example. And they could absolutely gain incredible benefit from popular mindfulness, conventional mindfulness or worldly mindfulness maybe, but they never did. And they were discouraged from doing that. And I've met spiritual communities that actively discourage people from pursuing not just worldly mindfulness, but also therapy and mental counseling and so forth. So for me personally, uh, just my personal choice, my personal preference, I try to see all the value and the beauty in the first definition and the practices associated with it. And then also be clear about the second one. And that's the only one we're going to be using in this course. So the first one is important to just offer that context. Which Pali Sanskrit word or phrase approximates the classic definition of mindfulness? It's the same mind, it's the same word in Pali in Sanskrit, and then a different word in Tibetan for both definitions. But uh, in terms of history, we could say that for a long period of time, the only understanding of mindfulness for that term, sati in Pali, smriti in Sanskrit, and then drempa in Tibetan, the only definition that historically existed was this, uh, this one, and then maybe at some point slowly it evolved into this one. That's one historical theory about this. There are other theories, other interpretations. However, I'm just saying we could see it in every which way. However, uh, the literal meaning of, for example, drempa, which is the meaning for mindfulness in Tibetan, is memory, remembering something, not forgetting something. So if you are to say, I forgot something, you would in Tibetan literally say it slipped from my memory, the same, using the same uh, word. From what I know, it's also this, the word for memory in uh, classical Chinese and other languages that use these terms. So it's a, it's a very direct connection there. Uh, moment by moment awareness is also memory, not forgetting the present, right? That's also fine. Um, but these are just slightly different flavors. They're slightly different flavors of awareness, both very helpful, um, but yes, they serve different purposes. So for cultivating the four measurables, we would primarily need the classical definition. Why? Because Sometimes projecting loving kindness to people who are 70 billion miles away, uh, so to speak, they're just far away, uh, or extending loving kindness to ourselves as a child 
that's not present-based awareness. That child no longer exists that lived in the past, but we can absolutely send love and kindness to ourselves in the past. So from that point of view, mindfulness, we need the mindfulness that is not simply present centered at all times. So that's that. And the accompanying quality, the other side of that power couple that we'll read about in the book is introspection or vigilance, another translation for it, or introspective awareness. And just once again, to uh, voice those things for whom they matter, for people that they matter to, uh, they're called Sampajanya or Samparajanya in Tibetan and Pali, oh, sorry, in Sanskrit and Pali, and then Shishin um, in Tibetan. Uh, but the definition there is repeatedly checking on the state of our body and mind. So while mindfulness, while mindfulness is not forgetting about the cup, I need to be non-forgetful, hello. Introspection is the little corner of our mind that checks Oh, am I getting tense in this process or am I still relaxed? Am I getting distracted or am I still focused? Just that little bit basic level of quality control there. Without this quality control, we would lose our mindfulness and fly away. And 70 minutes later, we'll, remind our, we'll recall that we're in a cushion supposedly meditating. Hello. Happens. And that's why in some spiritual communities and in some meditation apps, they use regular mindfulness bells so that when people, even when people do get distracted for five whole minutes, the little mindfulness bell after five minutes brings them back and the meditation continues. And then five minutes later, it brings them back again. That's very helpful. Advanced practitioners don't need that, but I'm a beginner, so I find that helpful for me. There is any effect in sending loving kindness into the past, maybe accepting the positive effect in ourselves. There is the, the positive effect is the positive effect in ourselves. One reason to sell loving kindness to the past to our, for example, ourselves as a child is because it helps us change our attitude towards ourselves now. It helps us deal with our trauma. It helps us deal with our brokenheartedness. It helps us deal with the negative attitudes we have for ourselves. And if more people on this planet had less negative attitude towards themselves, more balanced view of themselves, more self-compassion, but also, of course, more wisdom, more discernment, there would be less crazy despots running around and starting wars. That's very, how, what could be more impactful than that? In fact, as I, some people also are taking the CEB course, uh, it runs on Saturdays, so, uh, and it's almost at the end, but I, quote, I quoted this statement from, once again, Garchin Rinpoche yesterday, I'm going to quote it now. Garchin Rinpoche says, the main benefit you get when you send wishes into the world. May the world be at peace. May no one suffer from the pandemic. May there be no wars. May the planet be healed. May all always find joy. Da, 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 da. Buddhist tradition. The Buddhist tradition has very long prayers like that. Someone sometimes 200 pages. There can be a collection of these prayers of this nature for hundreds and hundreds of pages. Well, what's the benefit of it? Can it affect the world? Some people believe it can. Some people don't believe it can. We can have different views about that. That's actually referenced in the book uh, for measurables. But Garchan and Pache says the benefit is actually, in addition to everything else potentially, is that when we wish good things for good things to happen to the world, if we want for the world to get better, what will end up happening is that our own mind will get better. And what could be better than that? Not as in like, oh, my mind got better, so I'm now joyful. No then what we extend out into the world is more wholesome. We harm less. We bring more happiness. Well, that happens, of course, through mindful awareness uh, and introspection being used together skillfully. And the last point, the last beat, and that's a good note to conclude on, actually, is that as we're continuously applying mindfulness towards the breath, for example, the sensations of breathing and introspective awareness that just gently checks, am I distracted? Am I sleepy? Is my body tight, tight uh, in, ten, in a state of tension? Is my body relaxed? Just that helpful checking voice, which doesn't need to be too loud, but also needs to be present somewhat for most of the stages of cultivating attentional balance. As we're using that, we're moving away from these attentional imbalances. Uh, they have traditional names, laxity and excitation. Laxity is also sometimes called sinking, because I'm Ooh, like that. And laxity has a grosser form called dullness. So we would have these words, laxity, dullness. Then there's also lethargy, sluggishness, torpor, all from the same range of, we're kind of losing it. And then excitation, agitation, distractions, 
just being too energetically charged and therefore jumping from one thing to another. Two main obstacles in concentration practice. They are, in psychological terms, sometimes also referred to as attentional deficit and attentional hyperactivity. So deficit or laxity is losing clarity and precision of attention. I'm really trying to focus on these slides, Lopsan. I'm trying to, but my eyes are closing and your voice is so boring and I'm just falling asleep. So I'm just falling into dullness. Maybe because I'm tired, but also maybe because it is boring. Even though we could say nothing is boring from its own side, it's just our attitude to it. Well, who cares? I'm still falling sleepy. That's one thing. Or excitation. I'm trying to follow the explanations, look at the slides, think, how does this pertain to me? But I'm just agitated, so I need to check my phone, and I need to look at my book, I need to play with my cup, I need to send these messages, and so forth. Our mind is all over the place. Happens all the time, because we vacillate between these two extremes all day long. And when we start shamatha training, through the practice of loving kindness, as we will discover, or through the method that we've been using and will continue using, mindfulness of breathing throughout the body, or we could also accomplish that somewhat through settling body, speech, and mind in their natural state, we're releasing to a greater and greater degree both laxity and excitation. Or we could say when we're feeling more lax, we're cranking it up a little bit, adding clarity. And then when we get agitated, ex there's excitation, we're moving it back to greater ease and constantly finding that balance we're progressing along the stages. And even if at the end of our practice for a month or a few months, we find ourselves just getting a bit less distracted, we're finding ourselves less sluggish in meditation, but also in daily life, there's more clarity. We find ourselves less agitated, but in meditation and in daily life, less excitation. And also as a basis of that, we just find that there's a greater level of ease or relaxation in our body and mind at all times including when we go to sleep, when we see an increase in relaxation, stability, and clarity, or the clarity is the opposite of laxity, stability is the opposite of excitation, and relaxation is the necessary basis for all of that. That's why we start with settling body, speech, and mind, and we spend time on it. When we see that increase, when we see that improvement, we know, hey, a shaman to practice, which is a form of kindness for myself, a gift to myself and to the world, the world would do better if I were to be more focused, but also relaxed, at ease, that is, and also clear. So stable, clear, relaxed, all good. Uh, we'd much rather hang out with people who are at ease, stable, and clear in their thinking and their awareness than people who are tense all over the place, not able to focus on us or anything else, but also really, really dull in their awareness, right? Um, as we increase that, we know, hey, my practice has not been in vain. I was doing these, these tiny bits, meditation here and there. As Deepama says, sometimes just aware of one in-breath and one out-breath, and sometimes doing a lot of proper formal practice, attending retreats, listening to these guided meditations with Alan Wallace. Da, 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 da. As a result of that, there has been change. And whatever change we observe through this, removing attentional imbalances, would be the foundation, the basis for the four immeasurables. That's why... Dr. Wallace in the book first presents ethical trainings and eudaimonic well-being in general, and then some information on shamatha practice. Why? The more relaxed, the more stable, the more clear we become, the better are the chances that our four measurables are going to be powerful as well. And yes, later on, we can use loving kindness or compassion or empathetic joy or equanimity, but primarily the first three to cultivate relaxation, stability, and clarity. Loving kindness is a full method for cultivating these three qualities as well. But when we do that, we are actually still going to be using mindfulness and introspection. Because when I am sending those teeny tiny rays of loving kindness to all of you, for example, or any other object that is important in my practice, I do want to be remembering you and not distracted towards something. And so for that, I need a teeny tiny part of myself to ask, hey, are you still focusing on your objects? Or are you dreaming about this? bowl of pasta that you want to eat tomorrow or something like that could be so that's why that little voice is helpful it is necessary actually for me to progress and it is a wonderful companion to my mindfulness and mindfulness to circle all the way back is one of the many wonderful forms that i can give to the energy of my awareness 
And the wonderful thing to celebrate right here and now as we're concluding this class is I have this energy of awareness and I can shape it in a billion ways. And yes, right now, automatically it gets poured into those vessels of anger and trauma and obsessive thinking and all these sorts of things. But I can reclaim some of that control. I can harness that energy, which is one of my favorite words in English. I can harness that energy and do cool things with it to be happy. So that's the conclusion there. So uh, the meditation that I suggest to we continue using uh, for the remainder of the week is still mindfulness of breathing throughout the body. But we will also send out this very helpful explanation of settling body, speech, and mind from Tenzin Wangu Rinpoche that I've mentioned, where he talks about pain speech, pain body, pain mind, and how we can work with them. And I hope that would also uh, add some inspiration for these two primary methods that we're using. If you also want to do vision quest, which is what we began this course with, absolutely very meaningful. That's always a meaningful practice to do. But beyond that, I would definitely recommend reading chapters two and three in the book, highlighting the quotes that you like, maybe writing some of them out if they feel inspiring, and also knowing that everything that's presented in those chapters about advanced stages of shamatha and so forth, that will come in due time. We don't need to use all of that right now, but it's a map that will always be with us. And there's also a very helpful explanation of the five afflictive energies that cloud the clarity of our mind. So once again, even though we're not gonna be looking at them in detail right now, uh, that map will prove very helpful in the future. So just generally familiarizing ourselves with it as we take some time to be kind to our body and mind every day, to observe our breathing mindfully, to practice this mindfulness that is not forgetfulness, the tr traditional definition of it, and then through that to acquire, acquire greater stability and well-being. So that's my wish for all of you for the week. I hope that you find greater ease, that all your days and nights are peaceful, that you find lots of joy um, in your friends, in your families, in your communities, in yourself, in your practice, and that in seven days we will reconvene to once again do a joyful exploration of the four immeasurables. Thank you. And wishing you lots of joy and lots of ease. Thank you so much and see you soon.